Shabbat Shalom. Um, we started at about 10 o'clock. I uh, don't know how many of you were with us when we started, but we've filled this room, uh, maybe not filled it, but uh, tried to fill this room with uh, the prayers of the Jewish people um, for Shabbat morning. It's strange to be here alone, and yet um, I hope some of you are connecting um, not just with me, but with this place um, through this uh, through this live stream. Um, so we've done shacharit. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we're not going to do a Torah service. Uh, in next week, we may try something different. Um, we may try a Zoom minion uh, online, or um, uh, I don't know. We'll we'll figure something out. But uh, for now, we're going to go on. Um, with a little bit of Torah study, um, but sometimes there are little gems in the Siddur that we don't quite see. Um, and so on 169, if you have the, either the Lev Shalem or if you have the PDF that we sent out, um, I just want to look on 169 for a second um, at, a, at a collection of prayers that, um, that is included in this Siddur. Um, that are, some of which are said before the ark, and uh, while they're personal prayers, I just want to offer um, one of them today, um, or perhaps two, I don't know. Uh, in the middle of the page, I, I saw that there is a prayer that we say when sad, um, and while, uh, while I know Shabbat um, is a day of joy, um, this is included in the Shabbat Sidor, I think, um, as a recognition that there are times when, um, when we feel a sadness in the world, and certainly that is one of the emotions that I, and I know many people have felt um, as we go through this period of um, being physically distant um, from people who, uh, who we love and care about. So I wanna offer that prayer um, as while the ark is not open, um, as we are before the ark. Master of the universe, See the sadness in our souls. We ask you to heal our grief and despair. We wish and hope to do your will, but sometimes our sadness overwhelms us. We ask that your instruction touch our beings so that we might find comfort in the world that you have created and so that we might find the strength to be a comfort to others. May the souls that you have given to us give us the strength to turn sadness into joy, to turn despair into song. Master of the universe on this Shabbat, we ask you to send healing and let us say Amen. So, I sent out a, a teaching. Um, by the way, I just want you to know I have my hand sanitizer uh, here, um, which I'll put on a little bit more of, uh, just for good measure. And I also, I hope it's okay, I brought uh, a little cup of tea to keep me company, which I'm gonna reach back and have a little of right now. Baruch atadim chalam shakol miyed bivaro. Um, and I sent out a teaching uh, from one of my favorite commentators, the Kli Yakar, um, for this Torah portion. And, um, and so what I want to do is spend, I don't know, the next 20 minutes or so, uh, maybe longer, uh, learning this teaching. Then we will recite some of our communal prayers, um, uh, including a Misha Berach for Cholim, um, and then we'll finish up uh, with, um, with a Musaf service. So the, this week's Torah portion, uh, it's, it, there, uh, it is one of the special Shabbats leading up to Pesach. So this is um, uh, Shabbat HaChodesh. It's the Shabbat before the new month of Nisan, um, the month of Nisan in which uh, Passover takes place. Um, 
And then it is also a double Parsha. Um, the double Parsha is Vayakel Pekude. Vayakel um, fr comes from the word Kihila, um, which means to, uh, which is a community. So Vayakel is to um, convoke, to uh, call the people into community. Um, and Moshe calls all of the people together into community um, and then gives them uh, the command and they go out, they go ahead and, and construct the Mishkan. We read a couple of weeks ago about all the instructions for constructing the Mishkan. Then we had last week the um, Kitisa, which includes the sin of the golden calf and a, and a census and other things. Um, book ended by a commandment to keep Shabbat that while we're building the Mishkan, we should also um, we should nevertheless keep Shabbat. That is, by the way, um, from where the rabbis derive um, the many different type, or it's at least one theory about where the rabbis, the rabbis derive um, all of the different types of malachot, of special kinds of labor that are forbidden on Shabbat, because the Torah at some point says, um, build my tabernacle, but keep, but, ach, um, keep my Shabbats. Right, with, that we should still keep Shabbat. And so the way that we learn what not to do on Shabbat is anything that involves the building of the tabernacle, which is how things like, um, like dyeing or tying knots or, um, or writing or other things like that come to, be, um, come to be included in the prohibitions around Shabbat. Um, so Moshe calls the people together. The people construct the Mishkan. Um, in Pikude, there's an accounting of all of the materials that was used um, one of the things that the rabbis say about um, Piku Dei is that Moshe gives an accounting because the, um, there's a lot of gold and a lot of silver, and Moshe wants to be very clear that, um, that everything that was given for the Mishkan was actually used for the construction of the Mishkan. Um, he wants to be above any suspicion um, in terms of when it comes to dealing with money, um, and it's uh, one of the Sources and one of the very idea that um, that transparency in terms of nonprofit organizations and um, just transparency in terms of um, when we are using the community's resources is is one of the highest values values of the Jewish tradition. Um, and then there is a verse uh, where and it's if you want to look up in a chumash that you may have, um, let me go and grab a chumash actually from here. Give me a second. So you can, um, the, the, the chapter and verse that I want to look at is chapter 39 of the book of Shemot, um, and it's verse, excuse, yeah, chapter 39 and it's verse 43. Um, so if you are looking in an Eitz Chaim um, at home, I'll give you the page in just one second. Uh, let's see. Chapter 39, verse 43, is on page 568 and 569. Um, so uh, the, everything is completed. Um, this is the, at, the, at the very end of, the, of Piku Dei. We have the entire accounting. And then, um, and we are told several times, just as the Lord had commanded Moses, Kechol asher tziva Adonai et Moshe, Kein asu b'nei Yisrael, um, so did the uh, Bnei Israel do at Kol Habodah all of the all of the work that everything was done um, exactly as commanded. Um, I think there's an emphasis there in the sin of the golden calf. We use the material of gold, and we sort of um, either you know we, uh, the 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 idea that we are going to build a physical place that's associated with God um, is a permission given. But I think the Torah is emphasizing it. Everything needs to be done exactly as commanded so that this way of, of worshiping God um, is appropriate and, do, and doesn't become idolatry. Um, and then we have this verse, Vayar Moshe et kol hamelacha, um, that God, uh, excuse me, that Moshe saw all of the work, vihine asu ota, kashir tziva adunai ken asu, um, and look, uh, behold, they did it, meaning the work, just as Adonai had commanded them, so they did it. Vayivarech otam Moshe. And God blessed them, um, presumably meaning all of the artisans um, who, were, who took part 
um, in the construction of the tabernacle. And um, the rabbis, uh, always looking to explore um, the meaning behind the meanings or, or always looking to, to sort of figure things out at a deep level, they asked the following question, the Kliyakar asked the following question um, about this. Uh, Ma bracha bercham, um, what blessing, when Moshe gives a blessing to these people, the rabbis want to know, what did he say? Right? What was the text, what words came out, of him to come out of, came out of his mouth? When we give a blessing to our children on Friday night, um, we use the priestly blessing. For boys, for girls. And then we say the priestly blessing. May God bless you and keep you. Um, at other times, we may invoke um, blessings uh, extemporaneously. We may give someone a blessing and then speak to them the words uh, of our hearts at a Jewish wedding. Uh, a, a bride and groom are understood to have a, a special capacity for blessing. And so um, we approach the bride and the groom um, in the, during the Tish and the Kabbalat Panim um, or at any point during the day and we ask them for a blessing um, which can be the words uh, of their hearts. Um, and so the rabbis want to know, well, what was the blessing that Moshe gave to the artisans? And interestingly, the Kliyakar um, says it's something very specific. Um, the words that he says uh, were used is, Yehi ratzon shetishresh khina b'ma'asei yedechem v'hi noam adunai elenu v'gomer. And um, the, uh, the, the blessing is, may, the, may, the, um, may it be your, uh, God's will that the shechina will dwell upon the work of your hands. And then there is a quotation from Psalm 90. So if you have the Siddur, um, I want to invite you to open your Siddur to Psalm uh, 90, which is on page 129. Um, if you don't have it, that's okay. I included it actually um, also as a, the, the third page of the PDF um, that we sent out. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go through, um, uh, I'm not going to go through everything uh, here. But what I do want to point out to you is, first of all, notice at the top that this psalm begins with a title that says, Tefillah le Moshe ich ish ha Elohim, um, which means a prayer of Moses, man of God. This is the only psalm, and the commentary actually says this, if you look at the PDF, I even, uh, we underline this, this is the only psalm ascribed to Moses. And so the Kliakar says, ah, right, we, we actually have a psalm which is ascribed to Moses um, that Moses wrote. We have some sort of uh, ancient words that, that we know he wrote as a time of prayer. And look at how they end. Look at the last words of the page uh, at the bottom at the arrow. Vihi noam adunai Elohenu alenu umase yadenu konana alenu umasa umase yadenu konenenu konenehu. May the peace of the Lord our God be with us. May the work of our hands last beyond us, and may the work of our hands be lasting. Okay, and it's I think these last words may the work of our hands last beyond us that provoke the Kliyakar to say, and it's not just the Kliyakar, by the way, it's also the, the um, Rabbeinu Bachia and others who ascribe these words to Moshe specifically as the blessing that he gave to the artisans upon their completion of the tabernacle because, of course, the work of their hands is the Mishkan. It is the tabernacle, the physical place that they're constructing um, as a dwelling place for God in the world. And, um, and so now I want to just read through a little bit more of the Kliyakar's teaching um, because what he wants to say is, I, I, I left out a little part of it, but Rabbeinu Bachya makes the argument that, um, you know, that, that just based on the ending, that this was the blessing that he was given. And the Kliyakar is saying, no, I actually think that, that um, the whole of this psalm uh, was part of the blessing that Moshe gave um, at this moment. And so I want to read this through with you. Um, I wish it was a little more interactive. Please 
uh, forgive me, but we'll sort of do the best we can under the circumstances. I say that, that according to the Kliyakar, Ve'omer ani shiyesh remez nachon el binyan ha-mishkan b'tichilat ha-mizmor, I say there is a clear allusion to the construction of the tabernacle at the beginning of Psalm 90 and at its end. Okay, so we looked at the end, at the, um, but he now wants to say at the beginning. At the beginning, so how is there a relationship between this psalm at the beginning as well? At the beginning it says, and um, let's just look at the first words of the psalm, Ata, excuse me, Adonai, um, uh, God, Ma'on Ata Hayita Lanu Bedor Vador. Um, you have been a dwelling place for all generations, right? So for all generations, meaning for eternity, you have been a dwelling place, okay? And Kliakar is gonna explain this as, as, pot, as, as, as follows. This is in consonance, this you know, accords with the approach that King Solomon stated in his prayer when he dedicated the Holy Temple. So Solomon builds the temple centuries later, and he is dedicating the temple, and he says as follows, behold, the heavens and the heaven of heaven cannot contain you. Um, how much less this house? And he's raising this question of, how do you build a house that's supposed to be a dwelling place for God when God is, of course, bigger than any physical dwelling place, right? And, and, and so even at the moment of doing exactly that, of dedicating a dwelling place for God, Solomon, Melech Shlomo, is problematizing the very idea of, the, of the, uh, that one can build a dwelling place for God because, of course, God is greater than this. Um, I like to point out that the rabbis actually do this in the words of the Kaddish, um, where what we do is we say, So we say all of these blessings, that God is blessed and praised and this and that and that and that, and then we say the words, that God is beyond any blessing or song that can be said. So we try, but then we actually point to, hey, let's, let's understand that the words that we're using are inadequate, okay? And, and King Solomon is saying the same words when the temple is, dedicating, is being dedicated. He's saying the temple, the physical temple is of course inadequate, um, even though we've put a lot of effort into it. And according to Kliakar, Moses is saying the very words um, when Moses begins this psalm, Adonai ma'on hayita lanu bedor vador, um, Lord, you have been our refuge in every generation. Um, and let's even just continue to read it a little bit. Before mountains were born, before you shaped earth and land from the very beginning of time, you are God, right? So he's saying, we're, we're building a mishkan, but let's be very clear that you don't actually have a dwelling place. And now let's read on in the Kliakar. You are the dwelling place of the world, and the world is not a dwelling, is not a place nor a dwelling for you. Okay, and there's actually a teaching in the Midrash um, that we call God Hamakom, the place. And why do we call God the place? Because God is the place of the world, but the world is not God's place. And so, if so, how can it cross one's mind to say that they should pray, um, prepare a house to establish God's presence there? You can't, you can't do that. Okay. Um, and, and he goes on to quote the verses, a proof is given before the mountains were born, you shaped earth and land, from, and from the most remote past till the distant future, you are God. Um, and let's just, we'll, I'll finish up the teaching. If God had to establish a presence in a particular place, where did God establish God's presence prior to the creation of the world? Um, rather, certainly the world is not God's place, but on the contrary, God is the dwelling place of the world, right? Um, and so, so the first thing that I wanna point out about this teaching, and, and then I wanna, I, I wanna pick, pick up the last part of it, but um, I, I think part of the reason that this teaching spoke to me today um, is that I think we are in the middle of what, what I'll call a black swan moment. Um, there was a, 
a book, and you'll forgive me, I don't ha didn't have it with me, but um, it was written by a behavioral economics uh, economist who who speaks about how um, history changes. We think that history sort of um, that the that the future is going to unfold according to the pattern of history. Um, and we develop expectations that tomorrow is going to be the way that, to, that yesterday was. Um, but he says that we are, in that sense, like the chicken um, who is being raised um, for slaughter. That the chicken is in the, um, let's hope it's a free-range chicken, um, that it has where to go. Uh, it wakes up every morning, it has food, it has a nice place to live, it's being taken care of. And it believes that tomorrow is going to be the same thing. And that repeats itself over and over and over again until one day it's slaughter day. And the chicken is not waking up for a nice breakfast and to be taken care of, but it's being waking up, you know, uh, it, it, it's being uh, brought to have its head cut off. And um, while I don't want any of us to have our heads cut off, uh, I, I bring the analogy to say he, he goes on to argue that actually history unfolds in this way that that um, it then unfolds with sort of great shifts that happen very, very quickly. And I think if you had asked us um, two weeks ago, did I think that in any scenario, two weeks ago, um, would I be sitting in, the, in this room um, by myself on Shabbat trying to connect and speak with you via, uh, via Facebook Live, via live stream, um, the idea would have seemed absurd to me. Um, I think many of us uh, are living um, in a reality that is disorienting, um, that's dizzying, and, and, and I think this teaching spoke to me because for me there is something very comforting um, about the idea that uh, God is the place of the world and rather than the world being God's place. Because if the world is God's place, it's in some ways we prepare a place for God and, and it's all up to us. Um, and, and the survival of the world, uh, the survival of God actually depends upon the survival of the world. And, and when we say that God is the creator of the world and God is the place of the world, I think there's a, the deep philosophical statement that we are saying is that even though the world right now feels very chaotic, um, ultimately we believe that there is a creator. We believe that there is someone who will outlive this world um, and that there's a reality beyond which we can see. Um, I think in a world where we are being asked to shelter in place or to stay at home and we can't go out and sort of conquer the, the world of space, we can't go out and be with each other um, in the ways that we could just two weeks ago, um, I think part of what this teaching is saying is that even though you can't go conquer the world, um, you can find God. You can encounter God um, in every place, which means, um, yes, here in the sanctuary, even by myself, it means on the internet, um, it means in our homes, it means in the small things that God is sort of never beyond us. I, I spoke earlier um, about how when we say the phrase, even in the Amidah, that God is matir asurim, that God frees those who are bound, that what we're saying is not that, um, that God is, is going to somehow miraculously break the, uh, you know, stop the epidemic and or the pandemic and, and allow us to go out and be in contact with everybody. God willing, that, I hope that that will happen um, in, you know, in, in a short amount of time. But in the meantime, God is still matir asurim. God still frees those who are bound by helping us because God is not bound by place. God is the place of the world. And so God um, is wherever we are.
um, is in our homes, uh, is, is in the small things that we do, is in, um, is in the walk that we take on the street, um, and the silence that we can find uh, together. And the second part, uh, I want to just do, do the rest of this teaching. Um, so, so the Kliakar asks, therefore, how is it possible that God should command Moses to build a house for God, right? As if God was going to live somewhere. In other words, well, then why is this whole thing necessary? Why, go, why build a sanctuary, right? I'm sitting here in this holy space of our community um, that we recently redid. Um, why is it necessary to build a sanctuary if you can find God in the woods, or you can find God at home on your computer? Um, and, and this is a beautiful idea. Later in the psalm, um, in verse 4, it actually says, Tashev enosh adakava tomer shuvu v'nei adam, which reads, you, you crush human beings and you say, Rep repent children of, of Adam. Um, and, and the Kliyakar says, God had to forego God's honor to establish for God's self a dwelling among the earthly, okay, so there's no actual, it's actually a diminishment of God to shrink God's self, as it were, into the space of, of a sanctuary or into the space of a tabernacle. But why did God do all that? And this is an amazing teaching, in, in order to forgive, in order to forgive us for the sin of the golden calf, because there, there are teachings that say in the Midrash, Tanhuma, that the tabernacle was, uh, was a complete atonement for the, the incident of the golden calf. In another place we say the, um, the zahav, the gold of the mishkan was mechaper al zaho, uh, zahav uh, ha'ego, um, that the gold of the mishkan atones for the gold of the, um, of the golden calf. Um, and I just want to point out that at the heart of that teaching, it means that um, God gives us a mishkan and goes through a sense of diminishment um, out of a sense of love for us. And, and I, I want to sit with that teaching for a minute because I think we, we skip over it um, or we move past it too quickly that the image of God, the picture of God, the theology that we have in just those words is that um, God diminishes God's self a bit, okay, and takes a risk, okay, that people might point and say, oh, right, God is smaller, God lives there, quote unquote, right, as if that was possible. But God says, you know what, I'm gonna take that risk because I wanna forgive you. And and I think part of the picture that you have here also is that forgiveness means closeness, right? That to forgive someone um, means to, to be in their presence. You can't forgive from on high. You can't forgive from a distance. Um, in, in the rabbi's understanding, it's, it's actually sin which creates distance between, between us and God. I think, I think when we hurt someone else, um, it moves them farther away from us. And so forgiveness is an act of being brought close. And in a time when we are going through social distancing, I, hopefully it's physical distancing and not social distancing, um, I think that that idea of a God who wants to be close to us and perhaps because God is the place of the world, God can be close to us if m not by us leaving our homes, but as the Kotzka Rebbe would say in another time, um, where is the place of God's glory? It's wherever we let God in. And so part of our task as we are alone um, is to is to make room, um, to make room for God. And, and what I mean by that, you know, the word God is just a word. Um, but I think that saying that God is the place of the world, that, um, 
that, that God is a creator, um, I think also is an argument that, uh, that there's a purpose to things. And, and in saying that there's a purpose, it's also an argument of hope um, that things will get better. And I really do, I really hope um, that I can convey to you, um, you know, for me, a deep belief. This will get better. This is hard. This is very, very hard. And we've been through pandemics before. A few weeks ago, for those of you who were here, I read a prayer from the Talmud that describes God as Baruch Atah. Otser Hamagefa, that God stops plagues. And to me, there's something very deep about reading a prayer from hundreds of years ago, um, from 1,500 years ago, that says, that describes God as one who stops plagues, which means that we've been here before. We're not alone. Um, even though this is a difficult time. The last part of the Klia Kar, and then we'll f finish up. Um, perhaps it was for this reason the tabernacle was made in the pattern of the world. So according to um, the rabbis and, and others, the, the very structure and layout of the tabernacle um, corresponds to the way in which the world was created. Um, since prior to the giving of the world, uh, excuse me, of the Torah, the world was in chaos. And, a result, and as a result of the Torah, the world emerged from this state of chaos and because of the golden calf and the tablets being broken, it reverted to chaos, but when Israel was forgiven for the sin of the calf, the world emerged a second time from a state of chaos. It was if that, at that time, the world was created anew. And so part of what the Kliyakar is saying is that um, as, as this week we, um, we construct the, the, the tabernacle and we bring a space, um, what we're doing uh, Mos Moshe blesses this place, blesses the work of the hands of the artisans, blesses the work of our hands, um, that, th that this place is not only a dwelling place for God, but it actually is um, keeping the forces of chaos at bay. And, and I want to say to us that literally we have in our hands, um, you know, I have my hand sanitizer and by washing... Um, by washing our hands, um, there may, there, we may not be able to, um, to do everything to uh, immediately stop the pandemic, but, but uh, I believe that religion, that Judaism should make us more responsible, not less. I don't believe in this idea that when I decide that I'm going to believe in God, that it means I don't have to do anything. No, it's, it's just the opposite. When I take on a belief in God that it makes me more responsible and that we have literally in our hands by washing our hands, by keeping our distance, um, we have the capacity to keep chaos at bay. We have the capacity to build a mishkan, a dwelling place for God. And that means that, that not that we are helpless, but rather that um, our actions and our lives are desperately important. Um, so I want to urge us to keep hope. Um, I want to urge us with the work of our hands um, to, uh, to continue to keep the forces of chaos at bay. And, um, and I want to bless us with the blessing uh, of Moshe um, from this week's Torah portion Vihi noam Adunai Elohinu Alenu, Umase Yadenu Konana Alenu, Umase Yadenu Konanehu. May the peace of Adonai, our God, be with us. Make the work of our hands last beyond us. And may the work of our hands last indeed. And let us say Amen. So before